Hey, Dr. C here with you. So this is the comprehensive guide to iodine testing. We get lots of really good questions about, you know, if iodine is important and that some levels can help my thyroid. How do I know which level I'm at? How do I know where I am now? And if I've already tried to change my iodine, how do I know if it's been successful or not? And the cliff notes to this are that your easiest first step is to take the iodine inventory, which is a free online questionnaire. It'll give you a really good gauge of your current nutritional status. If you have already reduced your iodine and your thyroid function has not improved, you can do a test called the urinary iodine to creatinine ratio. And if your levels are not yet below 49 micrograms of iodine per gram of creatinine, then you've got further to go before it could recover. So that's a target under 49 on the urinary iodine to creatinine ratio. But that's after you've already been on a lower iodine regime. Okay, so that's the summary for those who are in a hurry. And here's the deep details in the story for the rest who want to hear all of that. So for starters, I want to think about some, some things we're measuring with iodine. And there's your iodine levels, your nutritional levels, and they would reflect what your daily intake is over the recent past. Then we've got your iodine balance. And that's really more about whether your thyroid is gaining iodine staying steady, or getting rid of excess. Those are the three levels of iodine balance. And the last thing is iodine in terms of toxicology. There's a point at where if you consume so much, it'll shut down your kidneys, your liver, your lungs. Now that's not a common problem. You know, if someone does ingest it, or if they're on medications that are very high in it, that can happen, but that's more about toxicology. So briefly to mention why it matters is that People all have a certain range of iodine they can tolerate. And too little causes thyroid disease. Too much causes thyroid disease. Way too much is toxic. And the average person is probably going to do okay. You know, they can do a little more, a little less, and be fine with that. But they're not the ones prone to thyroid disease. Those who are prone to thyroid disease, they have a narrower range of tolerance. And the more they get outside that range, the more the disease starts and the more the disease will continue for them. And the exciting new story is that if they get into a targeted low level, the disease might reverse completely. And if nothing else, being at that targeted level that takes care of that excess, their body can respond better to thyroid hormones. And that's if they're taking pills for thyroid hormones, if they're making their own, and they can also respond better to their body's thyroid signals, like the TSH. So that's why it all matters. So it's worth first understanding how iodine comes into our bodies. And we ingest it, our salivary glands, our esophagus, our stomach, our small intestine, they all have ways to pump it in and pull it in. And it's pretty cool, but the lower we are, the more we pull it in, and the more we get too much, the more we block it. So that's one more level of control that we have that gives us more adaptability to operate over a big range. Well, we also get it in by breathing it, <laughs> usually not much, but if we're at coastal areas, it can be some. And then also it comes across from our skin into our bloodstream. Now, about 92% of the iodine that we ingest by our mouth, we do assimilate and we absorb it. And when we're all done with thyroid hormones and iodine, about 92, 94% of the iodine leaves through our urine, so we pee it out. So if you caught that, the amount we absorb is pretty equal to the amount that we eliminate in our urine. And because of that, the amount that we ingest is similar to the amount that we excrete. And we can infer about one from the other. But here's some big buts. <laughs> we also get rid of a lot of it through sweat. We get rid of it through our stool. And the amount in our urine doesn't reflect the same day. It might reflect a three to six month average from the past. And it's not always just a recent shift. So when we're thinking about iodine, we think about measuring it for an individual and then measuring it for a group. There's a lot of easy tests for iodine that can see what a group has as an average. Now think about this. Let's say that a test is, I don't know, let's say it's 60% uh, variable. So any one sample could be, uh, it might be, it could be anywhere between say 50, 50 to 110 or to zero. Anywhere in that range could be your results. Now, if you've got 500 samples, all those highs and lows, they average out. And you can have a meaningful group average, even though one test is horribly inaccurate. 
And that's the way most iodine testing works. It's really good for what the group status is, and that's how it's been used to track what a population's intake has been. And the step taken from that has been that public health groups have looked at a population's average iodine intake, and they've looked at the population's rates of thyroid disease, and they've put those things together. And it's totally meaningful and useful, even though none of those tests meant anything for one individual. So hopefully that makes some sense. We think, too, about just ways in which there's different measurement tools available. So the biggest one is urine, and I'll spend a little time on that. Now, for urine iodine tests, we have spot urine, which doesn't mean you, you know, pee on a spot. <laughs> it means it's just a random sample, you know. And the contrast is it's not a 24-hour sample. You didn't catch all of your urine for a day. You just got one sample of it. So that's one. Then we have 24-hour urine studies. And we also have urine studies that do calibrate based upon creatinine. So what that means is one of the reasons that iodine can fluctuate is because your kidney activity can fluctuate. If you do take into account how much creatinine was released, that does help some of those fluctuations. But the devil's in the details. So there's a chart I'm going to share with you, and it shows that if you take at least 10 tests, you can be within 20% accuracy. But you need at least 10 tests to be within 20% accuracy. So that's the drawback of the urinary tests in general, is whether it's a spot test, a 24-hour test, or a creatinine-based test, you're still only within 20% of the target. Now, when I talked before about iodine balance, that creatinine test can be good enough to, to say your iodine balance. It won't say exactly how much you're getting, but you can know which of those three ballparks that you're inside of. Now, the other version of a urine test is called a challenge test. And this has been used in three different contexts. So one study was done in 2013, and they were looking at how radioactive contrast that had iodine-based, how long it took for that to get out of the body. Well, that took about 43 days on average, so a long time. The other way that test was used was in 92, and they were measuring people that had kidney disease, how quickly they could get rid of a high dose of iodine. And it turned out it took them weeks and weeks and weeks. So this test has been used in functional medicine with the thought that you could use a challenge dose of iodine to see how much iodine someone needs. The, the thought process is that your body would eliminate less iodine if you needed it. So therefore, if you took a big dose and you didn't pee it all out in 24 hours, your body must have needed that much. Well, the difficulty is um, it's not a valid premise on which that's based. Think about mercury, for example. You know, it's a bad thing. Our bodies can't get rid of it that well. But you couldn't take a big dose of mercury and say, oh, if that stayed inside of you, you must have wanted it. It doesn't work like that. And actually, the studies that were done on iodine challenge tests, they showed pretty much the exact opposite of the role that the test is being used for, for nutritional purposes. They showed that if there's less iodine coming out, that doesn't mean you need it. That means you can't eliminate it well. So having a small amount of iodine recover on a challenge test doesn't mean you need more iodine. It means you're the last person who wants more iodine because you can't get rid of it very fast. So that's a test that has really no legitimate purpose. Now we have serum tests. These are also called blood tests. And these tests are good for toxicology. So if someone gets way, way, way too much iodine, their blood level can help us know if their symptoms are related to that extra iodine or from something else. But this blood test, your body works hard to keep blood levels of iodine in a steady state. So it's only when you're completely out of control that that ever changes. It doesn't relate to your nutritional iodine status at all. Only when you're at that toxic threshold. And that's a threshold that you're really not on unless you're taking high doses of a medicine called amiodarone or unless you're drinking high amounts of liquid iodine. That can happen, but you can never take someone's serum iodine level and say, oh, you need more. It's not a valid marker for nutritional status. It's only used for toxicology. So two other tools that are available that are similar, we have thyroid volume, and we have a blood marker called thyroglobulin. Now, there's antithyroglobulin antibodies, so it's, it's not that. It's just thyroglobulin. This is the protein your thyroid uses to make hormone. And when thyroid cells die and wear out, <clears throat> 
they spill a little thyroglobulin into the bloodstream. So thyroglobulin is proportional to thyroid cell death, and it's kind of proportional to thyroid size. And they've shown that both thyroid volume and, I'm sorry, both thyroglobulin and thyroid volume, just how big the thyroid is, they are inversely related to iodine intake in populations. So in large numbers of people, the more iodine they consume, the smaller their thyroid gets and the lower their thyroglobulin goes. However, people that have thyroid disease, it's not a tight correlation anymore. So those are tests that have been used and talked about, but they're only for populations and they don't really apply to those who have thyroid disease. So to be comprehensive, there was a paper done about hair levels of iodine. Um, some things do show up in the hair when they're excreted, and the paper proposed that hair markers could show an average intake over a couple of months. You know, it seemed kind of appealing, but the paper was actually retracted and the study was disavowed. So that's there, but it's also not a valid tool. And then the last one would be skin levels of iodine. So a popular idea has been that you can put iodine on your skin, and if it's poof, if it's gone, the thought is you sucked it up and you wanted it. And if it's there for a long time, you left it there and you didn't want it. Well, the skin has no way of preferentially taking it up. And the question is, what happens to iodine on your skin? Well, most of it becomes transparent because it oxidizes and turns into iodide, which is clear in color. The other portion of that evaporates into the air, so it goes away. We do absorb some, but the amount that we absorb doesn't really relate to whether we needed it or not. And this is funny, but they did a pretty big study back in the 30s, and they had people that could use more iodine, those that could not, those that had good thyroid function, those that did not, and even some cadaver skin, some like some dead skin, and all those variables, none of them predicted iodine absorption consistently. So skin, not a valid tool. So what it comes down to is that iodine testing, there's no great options to know your status. However, you can know that by the iodine inventory quiz, which is easy, it's free, it's you know, no cost, it's no non-invasive. And if you have already done a low iodine regime and didn't respond to it, then you can check urinary iodine creatinine ratio and see what your iodine balance is. And if you're below 49, you are in a state of iodine balance. You know, the exciting thing, one of the big studies that showed that iodine regulation could reverse thyroid disease, 78.3% of the people in the study had normal thyroid function within three months. So what about those that did not? Let me see if I can do the math on the spot. So what, 11.7? Yeah, so of the, no, no, 21.7. Of the remaining 21.7% that did not regain normal thyroid function, they looked at these people. And so there was three groups of them. One group, their thyroid function was off by a huge amount at the beginning, and it wasn't normal in three months, but it was a whole lot closer. They moved by 50% or more. So their TSH might have gone from 100 down to 50. So yeah, they weren't yet fixed, but they were heading that way, and maybe some more time they could have gotten there. That was one group. Now, another group, when they did look at their iodine levels, they didn't yet get to that target. So, you know, like they say in the lottery, you, you, can't, you can't win if you don't play. And somehow or other, they didn't play. And I always assume good intentions. There's probably some hidden sources they were not aware of. So they didn't get to that range in which the thyroid could reset itself. And the last group was for those to where their TSH didn't move much at all, and they got to the good iodine level. Well, that was one person only out of the whole study that was like that. So this can help a lot. This can help for almost all people. But if it doesn't, you probably didn't get to the right level in some way. Before starting, iodine levels don't predict who can be helped and who cannot. Even if you're, someone said your iodine levels are low, you might have too much, and you might be someone that could benefit by being on the thyroid reset diet. But the tests before don't predict that. But afterwards, they can help sort it out if it didn't respond, if you're in that smaller group that doesn't. So that's all I got to say about iodine testing. <laughs> and the short version is that there's a lot of tests that are great, but they're not accurate for individuals. And the big thing there is the urine test. They're used a lot, but you need at least 10 samples to be within 20% accuracy. If you want to be within 90, uh, within like 5% error rate, you need over 200 samples. You've got to take urine samples every day for a year to get an accurate reading, and no one can do that. 
And the blood tests, they are good for toxic levels of iodine, but not for nutritional levels. So that's it. Dr. C with you. Take great care, and I'll see you real soon.